This exercise is concerned with stock issuances, and our corporation has been authorized to issue 100,000 shares of $2 par value common stock, along with 10,000 shares of 5% preferred stock. Uh, the preferred has a $100 par value. When our corporation issues the common stock, then the debit to cash must be for the cash received from the investors, namely $15,000. Now this was from the issuance of 5,000 shares, so clearly the corporation is issuing the stock to the stockholders at $3 per share. The credit to common stock has to go for par value. The balance in common stock is always equal to the par value of the shares that have been issued. So 5,000 shares at $2 par value gives us a credit to common stock for 10,000. If the shares are issued for more than par value, then the credit goes to the paid-in capital in excess account. If our stock is no par stock, then there can't be a paid-in capital in excess of par value account. If our stock happens to have a stated value instead of par value, then the credit to common stock goes for the stated value of the shares. And this account then would be called paid in capital in excess of stated value common stock. When the corporation issues the preferred stock, the same rules apply. We need to debit cash for the cash received from the stockholders. The credit to preferred stock is for par value. Our preferred has a $100 par value. We've issued 80 shares, so the credit to preferred stock is for par value 8,000. That means we have a credit difference of 4,000 to account for, and that's going to go into the paid in capital and excess of par value preferred stock account. In transaction C, our corporation issues common stock in exchange for an, an asset other than cash. When stock is issued for non-cash assets, then we need to value the new asset at its fair market value, if that's determinable, or value the new asset at the fair market value of the stock that was issued, if that happens to be a more reliable figure. In this case, we've just issued the common stock up here at $3 a share, and if that is the current fair market value of the shares, then $3 per share times 1,000 shares gives us $3,000. Now that happens to also be the fair market value of the machine. So in this case, we don't have an issue. But if the fair market value estimate for the machine differed from the fair market value estimate for the stock, then we should use whichever number is the more reliable to cost out the new asset. In this case, they're the same, so we'll debit the machine account for $3,000. And then the credit for it to common stock, as always, goes for the par value of the shares issued. $2 times 1,000 shares gives us the $2,000 credit. And then we need to put the remaining $1,000 credit into the paid in capital and excess of par value account. We now get into a section where our corporation engages in treasury stock transactions. Treasury stock represents shares of the company's stock that the company has bought in from existing stockholders. They're called treasury shares because in the old days they used to be held down in the treasury department in the corporation in the safe. Uh, these treasury shares represent a decrease in owner equity that is only temporary in nature. We are paying cash out to existing stockholders in exchange for their shares. But the shares are going to be held for a while and then reissued. And if that's the case, we want to reduce owner equity when we reduce the cash assets in the business to record this payment out to stockholders. However, the treasury stock account does not represent an asset. It represents negative owner equity, a decrease in the owner equity that occurred when the cash was distributed to the stockholders. Let's consider this illustration. We know that assets equal liabilities plus owner equity. And when investors make contributions to the corporation in exchange for stocks, then cash assets go up and the stockholders' equity goes up. And this is what we recorded in the first few transactions of this exercise. What's happening now is 
cash is being paid out to the stockholders. And if cash is paid to the stockholders, then their equity in the business has to fall. We're crediting cash to record the payment of the cash to the stockholders, and the debit goes to an account called Treasury Stock. But this Treasury Stock account has to represent stockholders' equity. It's a contra account to retained earnings. And the debit balance in Treasury stock then represents a decrease in the retained earnings account that occurs when the cash is paid to the stockholders. In effect, the purchase of Treasury stock works just like a dividend, except that this cash can be recovered later when the corporation reissues the shares. When the shares are reissued, cash assets will go up again, and the stockholders' equity then will go up as well the balance in this treasury account will fall. We've now returned to our uh, exercise illustration. When the shares are reissued, as we know, then cash assets will increase, and in this case we're reissuing a hundred of these shares at five dollars per share, so cash assets will go up by five hundred dollars. The credit goes to the treasury stock account. Now treasury stock, remember, represents a contra account to retained earnings. And when we debit it, we're really reducing owner equity in the corporation, but when we credit it here, then we are increasing owner equity. Treasury stock must be credited for the original cost of the shares when they were purchased, namely $4 per share. So when we issue the 100 shares, then we'll need to credit Treasury stock for 100 shares times $4 each, and that will be $400. Uh, in effect, the stockholders are giving us back the $400 we gave them in this transaction when the Treasury shares were first purchased. But they're also giving us an additional $100. And we treat this additional $100 as more paid-in capital, above and beyond the paid-in capital that we received when these Treasury shares were first issued. So the credit goes to a paid-in capital account called paid-in capital from sale of treasury stock. If our corporation reissues additional treasury shares and isn't able to reissue them at the same price that was paid for them or more, then we have a situation like this. We'll still need to credit treasury stock for the original $4 per share that was paid to acquire them, and when we reissue the 50 shares, then the credit to Treasury stock needs to be for 200. But the debit to cash is for only 150. We have a debit difference of $50 in our entry. What do we do with the debit difference? That debit needs to go to the paid-in capital account, if there is such an account with a balance in it on our books. If not, then the debit goes to the retained earnings account because now it does represent a permanent distribution of corporate cash to the stockholders. In effect, a dividend has been paid to them. Our balance in paid-in capital treasury stock is now 100 minus 50, a credit balance of $50. Our balance in the treasury stock account is 2,000 minus 400 minus 200, $1,400, and that represents the cost of the 350 shares that are still held in Treasury. When our corporation is ready to do its closing entries, then the balance and income summary will be closed. The corporate account that we use to hold the earned capital of the corporation is the retained earnings account. So income summary will be closed to retained earnings. We have quite an assortment of corporation accounts here that we're using to record all of the stockholder equity in the corporation. And when we prepare our balance sheet, they'll all appear in the stockholder equity section. Let's take a look at it. Here is our stockholder equity section on the balance sheet, and we see that the preferred stock is listed. The par value is disclosed because this is relevant information for creditors and other investors to know about. The number of shares authorized is also disclosed, and then the number of shares that have been issued and are outstanding in the hands of existing stockholders are shown. The balance in preferred stock is the par value of the shares that have been issued, $8,000. If we go back through our entries up above, we'll see that there is now a credit balance in the preferred stock account of $8,000. 
The paid in capital and excess account has a balance of 4000 and that's from our earlier entries. The common stock account, like the preferred stock account, has a disclosure of the par value, the number of shares authorized, the number of shares that have been issued, and then the number of shares that are outstanding in the hands of current stockholders. Remember, we still have 350 shares of Treasury stock. They're down in the Treasury Department and these shares are no longer outstanding. Therefore, there's a difference between the number of shares that have been issued and the number of shares that are outstanding. The balance in common stock is always equal to the par value of the shares that have been issued. So the balance in our common stock account is $12,000. The paid in capital and excess of par value account for the common stock is $6,000. And the paid in capital from treasury stock account has a balance of fifty. dollars these are all paid in capital accounts. That is, they all represent contributed capital. When we add them up, the total balance is $30,050. This $30,050 represents legal capital of the corporation. It's all the paid in capital. The earned capital in the corporation is reported here. The balance in retained earnings from our closing entry is $20,000 but the balance in treasury stock represents a distribution of this earned capital to the stockholders that occurred when the treasury shares were purchased. Now eventually we'll reissue these shares and when we do there's every chance that we'll regain this fourteen hundred dollars upon the reissuance of the shares. Presently the net balance in retained earnings is eighteen thousand six hundred and the total stockholder equity then is $48,650. This ends our video presentation and I hope you found it to be helpful.